This is In Hindsight, Half a Century of Research Discoveries in Canadian History, presented by Dr. Donald B. Smith and produced by the Ontario Historical Society. Today we're going to be doing our episode on a very fascinating individual, a very important individual, a very controversial individual, our first Prime Minister, Johnny MacDonald. And this is not a complete look at him. That's be too daunting for the, the occasion. It's, it's a look at his view of Indigenous people, but not... not Métis people. Now, that's a different topic. That'd be a whole volume in itself. It's more Johnny MacDonald's relationship, opinions, perspectives on the First Nations. And in this episode, that in itself is a huge topic, we're going to focus on the period that is not so well known. That is the earlier period of his political life. Uh, That is uh, in the Union of the Canadas. Ontario and Quebec were united before Confederation. It was called the Union of the Canadas, and we're going to look at that. In fact, that's what we'll really be focusing on. But also, we'll go a little further and look at his um, relationship with the First Nations as Prime Minister of Canada. But uh, once again, the it's out there, I'm making it quite clear, the emphasis will be on the earlier period. He had a huge career in Canadian politics, half a century in effect, and it, it's just it, it's just huge. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, we'll be selective. So in fact, the years that I'd like to pay particular pay particular attention to are 1844 to 1876. Why 1876? That's the year of the passage of the Indian Act, which is still with us. And the Indian Act actually was not passed by MacDonald. That's a misconception. It was passed when he was out of power. He was out of power from 1874 to 1878. And it's in those, it was in 1876, halfway between his entry into government, that Alexander Mackenzie's Liberal government passed the Indian Act of 1876. But we're going to go up to that because MacDonald accepted the principles in it. He did not, but he was not responsible for it. <laughs> that's that's a misconception. But he accepted the principles of it. So that's uh, really, there's a consensus. The Liberals and the Conservatives, there's not much difference when you when you get down to it on the approach to the First Nations. They both wanted assimilation. They wanted the First Nations to enter into the larger society. This they regarded as a progressive move because they didn't understand the First Nations. They didn't understand Indigenous Canada. They had no idea of its of, of its history, of its cultures. And this is just, this is a reality. We have to wait to the 20th century because um, before there's some enlightenment in non-Indigenous Canada. This is really, it's not there in the 19th century. So I'd like to just begin, though. MacDonald, my goodness gracious, I've been so surprised in the last 10 years, last, well, perhaps 15, be safe. There's been so much discussion of him, and it's it's extraordinary. I can remember, I can remember because I have these huge clipping files, which have been transferred to the wonderful University of Calgary archives. They've taken all my research notes on 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 this on for my book, uh, Seen But Not Seen, 150 boxes. So I, I, I'm basing this on clippings I've made over the years, now out of my hands. They're now at the University of Calgary, but nevertheless, still in my mind. And what is surprising to me is in 1970, there was a poll uh, or an investigation of impressions of Johnny MacDonald amongst primary school students. It was conducted by Information Canada in 1970. And they, I can't tell you the exact figures, but there was an extensive investigation and um, primary school students were asked about Johnny MacDonald. And the results were quite amazing. The students questioned. The majority thought that he had started a hamburger chain. Now, isn't that extraordinary? That's 1970. That's little more than half a century ago. And, and But yet today, Johnny MacDonald, he's so controversial, and his statues are going down, and attacks are made on his legislative record, and what have you. He's very much in the news. 
the indifference is astounding only half a century ago. Well, at the outset, this is my opinion. This is my own personal opinion. And history is full of opinions. That's all it is, ultimately. It's my perspective. I see MacDonald, let's put this right at the top, the banner headline, a man of his times. And the times are not ours. It's a different age. And MacDonald is very reflective of it. In some respects, he's typical of it. And one or two other instances, in, in several instances, he does show uh, more, uh, well, um, what do we say? A more po- There's a more positive side to him. And I'll touch upon that. It, it then has been discussed as of late. And to find that positive side, it's not so much in Western Canada. That's pretty atrocious record, uh, first to admit. <laughs> But in Eastern Canada, there are some, it, it's lighter. It's, it's, there are some positive moments in his experience in Central and Eastern Canada. And I'd like to bring those out. We're dealing with two different situations here. Eastern Canada, that is back to the Union of the Canadas, the Union of what is now Ontario and Quebec. The First Nations population was less than 1% of the total population in the 1840s, 1850s, less than 1%. Extraordinary, because just, well, generation or so before, the First Nations had been in the majority, but now they were outnumbered. A million settlers came to the Union of the Canadas in the 1840s alone. And the First Nations, numbered about 15,000, vastly overnumbered. So that's the reality. That's the context. The First Nations have become very small minority, perhaps 1% of the population at best. And the dominant society, the settler society, the settler colonists are absolutely dominant and in control. Well, MacDonald in Eastern Canada is best known for an act that he introduced in 1857 in the Assembly of the Union of the Canadas. The Union of the Canadas its legislature was in Toronto at this time. This is 1857 when this important bill is introduced by John A. Macdonald. It's the, in the Union of the Canadas. It was so acrimonious. The debates were so furious between French and English-speaking Canadians, it was impossible to agree upon a permanent capital. That only came later when Queen Victoria decided it would be Bytown, now Ottawa. But at this time, the 1850s, the capital is alternating between Toronto and Quebec City. And at this point, in 1857, it's in Toronto. And it, the, the legislature of the Union of the Canadas in 1857 was immediately beside what is now the site of the headquarters of English language CBC. Isn't that something? Big, right beside the CBC headquarters is the site of the legislature where in 1857, this important bill was introduced by John A. Macdonald, the Civilization Act, which sets up the policy, legal form, for the forced assimilation of the First Nations, just right beside, it's amazing. Well, John A. Macdonald introduced this in 1857, and it was, it was just taken as common sense. In the legislature, the idea of assimilating the First Nations through legislation, setting up a structure whereby they could enfranchise, that was the term used, that is, give up their Indian status. Uh, this is only adult males are have the power of, of doing this. It's a sign of the times. Uh, if they meet certain qualifications as regards property and a knowledge of English and French, and there's a several years, three years, probation, if they pass all that, they can become citizens. They can join the larger society. They can obtain the franchise, the vote. They can own property. They can sell property. They become citizens. And this is Johnny MacDonald and his contemporaries idea that the First Nations will become part of the larger society. They'll be assimilated, absorbed into it, and they will become full citizens of the greatest empire the world has ever seen, the British Empire. They'll have the full rights of citizens. And that's the intent of the Civilization Act. Now, unfortunately, there was no consultation with the First Nations at all. Very, very typical, actually, in any review of Canada's 
Indian policies, but in this instance, this very important case, no consultation. So it was just produced, and the legislature, liberals and conservatives, love it. It passes only one vote against, and otherwise consensus. This is just taken to be what has to be. Well, First Nations were not consulted. There was a very, well, on Six Nations territory, the Haudenosaunee territory, there is, on the Grand River, west of Hamilton, there is a big protest. But, boy, the politicians take no account of it, and the the press doesn't even cover it, except for a very minimal story. It's just ignored. The First Nations are so numerically insignificant, and the intent of the larger society is so great to take charge and to integrate them into the larger society that uh, there's no protest. It just passed unnoticed. Now, MacDonald, he was the one, he was attorney general at the time. So he introduced the bill. Now, I'd wish it was, could make it simple all the way through here. We've got uh, MacDonald totally on this assimilation side. But at the same time, the year before, I must point out, MacDonald had done, uh, he had respected a treaty, the Credit Mississauga, in 1856, had protested that their, uh, one of their treaties with the crown uh, in 1820, whereby their reserves at Oakville, uh, what is it, Oakville, Bronte, and, and Port Credit, large part of the Port Credit Reserve, were surrendered, and they were not compensated. This was not fully being respected. And McDowell intervened, and he did. This is incredible. This is the first to my knowledge, I've talked to lawyer friends, the first recognition of a trust agreement between the First Nations and the Crown. And MacDonald's verdict was they had to be paid for this land. It was a trust agreement which had been, uh, not been respected and they'd have to receive compensation for the use of this land. So we've got the Civilization Act and we've also got this intervention with the credit people. But it's not, I, I can't I can't go further with it. It just shows you that history is complex, especially this story. And MacDonald is extremely complex. Well, what was MacDonald's knowledge of First Nations people? Let's go back. And in my chapter, I have a chapter in my book, Seen But Not Seen. It's really my full meal, full quotation marks, full meal treatment of this topic. And there I'm able to go into detail and explain his early experiences with First Nations. They weren't many, but there was with Tyndanega. That's the Haudenosaunee or Mohawk community between Belleville and Kingston on the Bay of Quinte. He did know them uh, to a certain extent. And in fact, as a young lawyer, he participated in a murder trial and uh, he ingeniously was able to get a very mild sentence for this Mohawk who had been uh, accused of, of, of murder. And so he did have an experience and really uh, at the bottom level, McDonald did have that. And, and then, of course, he does have some association with the Mississaugas of the Credit because they, because of this intervention with the Trust Act, he uh, or the establishment of the recognition of the treaty as a trust agreement, they they did have uh, they acknowledged that, and so he. But overall, the contact is 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 limited. I must say. Later on, he did have a good relationship with uh, Doctor Peter Edmund Jones, who was Peter Jones's third son, who became a medical doctor, and with a Haudenosaunee or Mohawk physician, Aranateka, he had also a very good relationship. But these are professionals. He's fine with professionals, but the mass of the First Nations, no, he doesn't have contact, doesn't really have any expertise, but he sure is better informed than others in, of his political generation in politics. Now, in MacDonald, just before, that's now we're leading up to Confederation, of course, it's extraordinary how this single individual, well, not it's not just him, of course, but he's the catalyst. He is able to pull together British North America into a union, Ontario and Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, forming Canada in 1867. And at that time, First Nations were really minor. There's hardly any discussion of them at all. And they're made a federal responsibility, but there's not much discussion whatsoever. I don't think MacDonald, quite frankly, wanted to expand Canada immediately. Here was this country that had just been formed of four really different provinces, totally. And it just would be premature to go any further with it. Um, but... Uh, the pressures were so great, and and McDonald in a great quote 
and I've got this in the text. Uh, with every of the uh, with each episode, there's always a text, and that's that's the one to go to for extra detail. Uh, I quote this um, statement that Macdonald made to a, a British railway magnate, and he explained to him that he was not anxious to expand westward at all, but unless the Canadians did, the Americans would seize the the territory. And Canada would never have the possibility. He wanted to wait 50 years, but never have the possibility of becoming from Atlantic to Pacific. So he acted, and it really was too soon. Because immediately after we leave Central Canada, Eastern Canada, we're in a situation where the First Nations are dominant. The Indigenous peoples are dominant, without question. The non-Indigenous population is infinitesimally small. And in Western Canada, they... 175,000 Indigenous people. 175,000. Well, in the Union of the Canadas, there were only 15,000. And in the Union of the Canadas, there's a, a million settlers, or more than a million. And in Western Canada, there's hardly any. So this situation is it's a totally new challenge. And wow, this is uh, just... It's too much, and enormous mistakes are made. This policy for Eastern Canada being applied to Western Canada was, was ludicrous. And it was also complicated by this horrific development, the demise of the buffalo, the mainstay of the Plains Indians. So it's, it, it becomes quite a catastrophic experience in Western Canada. Now, I must point out, the record of Macdonald in the West is is terrible, um, in for several reasons, and mainly centered around 1885. But there's it's all in my chapter. I can't I can't recreate that. This part is well known, but I must point out that in the West, Macdonald did one important thing. Well, well, certainly one vital thing. He respected treaties. I, I, in the making, it was an obligation. There was a certain, um, I don't know, the, the legal authorities have not, the Canadian ones have not defined this at, at this point, but it's acknowledged that that there is a, an interest in the land. Uh, I, Canadian politicians are denying that interest is ownership, it's occupancy. Nevertheless, there's enough there that treaties must be made. That's what MacDonald believes, and he proceeds with treaties one to three, and uh, after he's he's out of power, 1874 to 1878, and when he's out of power, four more treaties are made, but they're by the liberals. But MacDonald believed in treaties, and that is extraordinary because the Premier of Ontario, the longstanding Premier of Ontario, Oliver Mowat, comes into power in the mid-1870s. He did not. He felt that the Ontario Premier felt treaties were unnecessary. And in British Columbia, that was the same approach. Well, McDonald's a contrary view. And so there's a positive. Keep marking them up. We'll need them. Because when you look at the West, the rep, the situation, the I'm not talking about the Métis, but that's reprehensible. The lack of uh, any kind of, oh, just wow. We'll, we'll come to that. Oh, episode on Will Jackson or Honoré Jackson. That's the episode on Real Secretary. We'll cover that well so I can, in good conscience, pass on. With the First Nations, it was raw, really raw. The forced, using starvation as a policy to get the First Nations to go on reserves, contrary to treaty promises, left, right, and go, left, right, and center. It, it, it's really not terribly impressive. But it's, it's disgusting, actually. Particularly the execution of eight Plains Indians at Battleford after the after the troubles of 1885. It, it, this this is this is to me that that's the high point of this. Macdonald, it, it's 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 a sad story, and I, I'm first to admit it. In Eastern Canada, however, there was I, I think some uh, a little bit of bright light, <laughs> particularly in respect to one aspect, and that is Macdonald was insistent that the First Nations, those that had property, those that could speak English or French, who passed a certain probation period, could become citizens. They could um, they could get the federal vote. And in fact, in 1885, the very year that all this horrible stuff is happening in Western Canada, in Eastern Canada, he extends the franchise, well, it's Parliament, of course, he's, his party has a majority in Parliament. His party extends the franchise to First Nations people who meet those criteria, without them having to hand over their status. They could still remain status Indians and have the vote. 
And this is extraordinary. I mean, honestly, this is this deserves some attention. The granting of the franchise. Peter Jones's son, who the third son who became a medical doctor, was enthusiastic about this and wrote a letter to McDonald about it. And um, it, it was in practice. The First Nations could, those, those that met the criteria, the adult, uh, adult males with property, uh, could vote. And that was McDonald's gift in 1885. So it's it's just, um, it's not clear. It's not black and white. There's something going on here that's different. And certainly it was, a di- there was a ma- major difference between East and Western Canada. And uh, so, uh, extraordinary, the granting of the franchise. And interesting, by the way, the franchise was not po- uh, when I say franchise that's the it's very difficult here the term franch enfranchisement was meant to uh, state that someone gave up their indian status and then the franchise is a different that's the that's the vote the federal vote that we have to distinguish we're not talking about the same thing the indian uh, the uh, gradual act of civilization was for enfranchisement that is giving up indian status and that what i'm talking about now is the franchise mcdonald is giving the franchise to the those adult First Nations who meet property qualifications and all pass a period of probation, but it, it, it's not they they can keep their status. They they don't have to. It's confusing, isn't it? They don't have to enfranchise. So, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, those two words are out there. But I think I hope the point is made. They could still, like like today, 1960. Stephen Baker introduces this again. The Liberals, incidentally, um, under Laurier, struck this down. It would have to be would, the First Nations would wait till 1960 before Diefenbaker inserted this again, and the, the First Nations got those. Well, actually, at that point, females as well, and and it's, it's it, they get the franchise, and of course, still have uh, rightly so. So that is McDonald. The contradictions of him. Um, he was. Um, uh, progressive in some more progressive in some respects than getting he gets credit for and uh, so it's important i think to study all of this in a nationwide perspective and look at central canada as well as eastern canada as well as eastern canada and and uh, i should say important to look at eastern canada as well as western canada now mcdonald is an assimilationist i said that right at the beginning this was the the, the this was the common sense, the common belief of the time, that this was a progression. The British Empire was the largest, greatest empire in the world, and First Nations were being allowed to become members of it, become if they enfranchised, if they passed through the, the giving up their status. Uh, that was that was the goal, and yet Donald he, he did bend it so they could get the federal vote. But overall, his objective is that they will integrate and, and join the larger society. And there's a, a bill passed in 1869, just after Confederation, which is to, uh, it strengthens up the Civilization Act. And then ultimately in 1876, this is a key date, uh, under the liberals, the policies the conservatives had developed and the liberals accepted was were, were consolidated and put into this Indian Act of 1876. This is a, a very, very draconian piece of legislation, which parts of it are still in effect today. This is what everyone's talking about. And, uh, well, the Indian Act, let's just keep in mind that I don't know if history is important. It's good to, not necessarily we're going to agree at the end of the exercise. There'll always be, <laughs> I hope so, that's only healthy if there's several viewpoints. But it would be interesting if the CBC, who, English language CBC, which are right beside the site of where the Civilization Act Act was passed, um, probed into this a bit just to see what was happening in the neighborhood in 1857, because it's that act that's still with us. It was passed right on their doorstep, on the, on the, I guess it would be on their east side. So wonderful, wonderful that, uh, it, it, I, I shouldn't say that. I'm just, I'm a historian who loves complexity. This is not a simple story. That's all I'm saying. And in the this episode, we're looking at 1844 to 1876. The text reinforces that. But for the full quotation marks, the full meal deal, please look at the chapter in Seen But Not Seen. Just like to end with, I have a actually a personal connection with this story, and it seems a appropriate moment, the only moment I probably will have to share it. I have a, a, a commonality with this uh, because I, 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 I feel somewhat involved with this because it's very strange. But McDonald, and this will just be short for him, we're, we're done, but I just have to include this. Just 
because it's so interesting on a personal level. When MacDonald, he, he lost the election of 1874, he was out of power, as I mentioned, for four years. In that term, at that time period, mid-1870s, he considered leaving politics and he established himself in Toronto. He continued to be a conservative leader, but he was distancing himself from it. And he bought a property in Toronto on St. George Street, opposite the University of Toronto. It's opposite Sydney Smith Hall. The house is still there. It's got a plaque, the whole works. Well, my personal connection is that with this is they also have another building, which is still standing. The University of Toronto, I should say. The University of Toronto now owns McDonald's house in the mid-1870s. And they also own the house that's next to it. Now, I have a personal connection with this story because it was in the other house that I defended my PhD oral. My oral exam was there in the house next to McDonald's house in eight. In 1975, exactly 100 years, the century after McDonald lived next door. So that's what I like about history. Always surprises. Thank you very much. We'll touch upon the Métis reaction to McDonald in the episode on Will Jackson or Honoré Jackson.